Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, today, my guest is Josh Chernikov, who is an innovative educator and entrepreneur with 14 years of experience in enhancing educational programs. He specializes in creating effective lead generation strategies for education companies, offering a 12-week ad sales elevation experience for sales and business growth. So, Josh, uh, do you want to take it from here and tell a little bit about your story? Yeah, I mean, you, you nailed it there. Thanks for having me on the show. But that that's a pretty good, concise introduction. Um, behind all of that is uh, somebody who uh, grew up in uh, Washington, D.C., always wanted to be on TV and do sports, went and got my undergrad degree in print journalism, got my broadcast master's degree from Northwestern, Made it on TV, loved it, made it to the NFL to work at the Washington Redskins Broadcast Network, and it didn't go as well as one would have hoped, but there was a lot going on at the at the Redskins at the time that I couldn't control, and um, wanted to kind of give back to D.C. as best I could, and I started a tutoring company. Um, I had no business really starting a tutoring company because uh, well, I had never started a business other than pushing my own lawnmower around. Um, and I only knew about tutors because I had a lot of tutors. Uh, but I started this tutoring company, and then I was able to pitch a story to the NBC affiliate in Washington, D.C. Um, and we were mentioned, story about us, and the company took off from there. And um, it was a you know one-to-one -one in home boutique tutoring company. Very, very fun, easy business to run. Um, I took on a more scalable, um, tougher business to run, my second business, as I was running the tutoring company. And that was a, an aftercare slash enrichment company. And um, uh, I eventually sold the tutoring company, rolled everything into the aftercare company, grew that from one school to three to seven to 82 schools up and down the East Coast. We were in six states. Um, we had a full team and, um, we had a letter of intent to be acquired. The company was ready to be acquired. I was ready for it. My partners are ready for it. My wife was ready for it. My kid was ready for it. And then the pandemic hit and, um, my business partners, um, had to focus on their business. So I took over the company with my COO, who's, I still work very closely with. We got it through the pandemic. Um, and then he eventually bought the company from me. So I took a step back and said, first of all, what the hell am I going to do? I don't have a business to run. So I, the only thing I know how to do is start businesses. So I started a business and is focused on lead generation in the education space. Um, and, um, you know, I figured, okay, well, I'll just bring all these CEOs and founders and entrepreneurs who are ready to work hard and grow their businesses leads. And I did that. And unfortunately, they didn't know what to do with the leads. And I didn't realize that they wouldn't know what to do with them. So I took a step back and I created the Ed Sales Elevation Experience with um, a member of my team. And um, basically, that walks companies, entrepreneurs, founders, wherever they are in the process, through a 12 week process where they go from um, whatever amount of leads they have, generally it's zero or not enough, to a steady flow of leads that they control. So they get to manage their own lead generation system and they know how to level it up, level it down, because too many leads can be a bad thing as well. So I'm very proud of what we've established and we have hundreds of people who have gone through the program and they have emerged um, and now they, they, they manage their own leads in the education space. Awesome. Yeah, man, that's an inspiring journey, uh, not without its hurdles and challenges, of course. Yeah. Um, I want us to take a step back because you mentioned that you wanted to work in sports and you started working with Redskins, but it didn't really work out that well. And you completely switched industries to tutoring, to starting a business, not being an employee. Um, how did that process go? Because um, I can imagine that 
if you envision yourself working in this space, but then you completely switch to something else, it was a quite a big decision, quite a quite a change. So how how did that go? Yeah, I mean, without me, you know, lying down on the couch and you being my therapist, it wasn't necessarily everything that I wanted to do. I mean, in life, you can't control everything that happens to you. Um, and so there were some life changes that happened. And certainly there was a lot of stuff that was going on inside the Redskins that if people go look, they'll find out. And we were at the epicenter of that. I didn't do anything wrong um, while I was there, but there was a lot going on around me that wasn't right that I didn't know about. And therefore that was affecting the culture and my ability to do my job. And so I guess my my knee-jerk reaction was to to try and do something else. Not to leave my job, but to do something else, to try and give back. Maybe I felt like I was like cleansing myself a little bit. And that's when I started doing the tutoring. So, you know, um, I think in the journalism business, you have to kind of be your own entrepreneur uh, because you have to create stories. You have to find stories. You have to nurture stories. So you, you essentially have to be an entrepreneur of, of, of making stories. Um, so I've always had that drive. Um, and so when I started the business, the tutoring business, it was something to do that was different. And then when we got on NBC4, it became a job, a business. Before it was just something. It was that lifestyle side gig, you know, hustle. But when we got on TV and in Washington, when, when Jim Vance and Doreen Gensler say something about you on TV, you're good to go. And so we were good to go. So the business took off from there. And um, yeah, again, like I didn't necessarily get to control all the changes in my life, but I tried to make the most out of them. And um, I once was told, you know, sometimes you just have to improvise and adjust. And at that time, I was improvising and adjusting, probably like you and I and other entrepreneurs have to do on a day-by-day -day basis. You improvise and you adjust. Definitely. And it's so interesting that you found a way to give back by entering this tutoring space. It's, it's very interesting how that kind of your things that you couldn't control uh, helped you pivot to this to this direction and start business in this space even though you probably didn't see yourself doing anything like that when you was a kid or a teenager no way i was i was not a good student um again i had a lot of tutors because i was not a good student. i was a bad student i just wasn't a very good student um so no i would never have pictured myself in the education space um, but it is absolutely what I know best now, and I'm happy to be in it. And, you know, I get to work with wonderful entrepreneurs. I, I'm really lucky, and I know that probably it won't be this way forever, but of all the people that I've worked with through the Ed Sells Elevation Experience, which is a journey, it's a 12-week journey together, whether we do it in a cohort or whether we do it one-to-one, -one, it's a journey, but I can, I can safely say that I would have a beer, at least one beer with every single person who's gone through the journey and with other people, because I have more in common, I'd have multiple beers, you know, so I'm really proud of the fact that um, I'm in the education space, not where I expected to be, but I think, you know, again, as entrepreneurs, we got to go with the flow, you know, and at that time when my life was turning me this way and that way. I went with the flow and and today we have to go with the flow. I'm sure you can look back. It's 115 today where we're recording this. I'm sure you can look back and say, didn't expect that to happen today. And how many times has that happened for us as entrepreneurs on a daily, hourly basis? And you just have to roll with it. And um, some of the stuff is good and some of the stuff is bad and whatever probably balances out on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, for sure. As an entrepreneur, what I found personally is you have to look for solutions and for opportunities in every situation because it seems like most 
most of the people are just looking for problems and things to complain about. But you have to change that mindset. You have to, you have to be in a bad situation, see it in a completely different mindset, and that helps you come up with something new, come up with new approaches, and figure out figure out how to make it work. Right. I think the point that I I, I appreciate that you're making, and that other fellow entrepreneurs would would also um, recognize and appreciate, is that you almost have to look like you said, to be in a bad spot. You know, it's almost like you have to drive the thing off a cliff to see how it performs, you know? And once you've driven it off a cliff, once you've seen it not perform the way you want, then you can make changes. And so I think you have to embrace those challenges. Um, and you're right, of course, then figure out the solutions. It takes a certain kind of, excuse my language, fucked up mindset, you know, to, to, to really like want to go through this, to be an entrepreneur. I have a buddy of mine who also started businesses. He's on his second. And um, we always looked around and like, why did we do this? Why? You know, but it's, it's, it's a rush. Yeah, and it's not just about money, right? You You just want to to build, to, to live in that kind of lifestyle, challenge yourself and do something which satisfies you and not just, I don't know, uh, work for, for, for someone or just making a good living. It's a little bit bigger than that. Yeah, it definitely is. I, I mean, I'm not sure what it is about. Again, you might need 30 entrepreneurs in, in a room with 30 couches where we all lie down and spoke to therapists and you might get 30 different answers. But there's something in our DNA, you know, that, um, that makes us want to run our own businesses, face the daily challenges, get back up, fall back down, um, that, that must really um, work for us and definitely doesn't work for everybody. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned that the issue with the Redskins was one of the pivotal moments in your life, a challenge that nudged you in a different direction. Um, and you also mentioned a big thing, uh, the acquisition that did not go as planned. Um, do you want to dive into that? How did you, How did you face that? situation that you uh that that you got into with covid pandemic uh things did not go as planned which many people anticipated including your family which makes it even harder yeah well i don't know anybody who could could have obviously planned the pandemic and you know played it 100 percent right um hey we emerged happy and healthy so that's good. That's the most important thing as a family. With the business, I would probably have done things differently. I can say that today, but if I wouldn't, you could have told me back then, and I would have said, no, we're not doing that. And in fact, my COO probably did tell me that, Michael. And um, he certainly tried to, to slow my roll on our pivot. Um, our pivot you know, as a business, once we knew that the acquisition wasn't going to happen, the pivot actually wasn't wrong. We were going to take our enrichment partners and our enrichment schools and bring them online. Sounds a lot like OutSchool. And OutSchool, which did that successfully and then had a valuation in the billions and struggling now, um, had a great run. I think their run is ending. Had a great run. And so it all comes down to execution. So the idea was there. Uh, we weren't able to execute at the time. Um, but the company did survive. Um, and now is thriving. And it was time for me to go at that point. Still one of the largest investors. And, and I think know the ins and outs pretty well. But I'm not the best person to run it. Probably the biggest fan there is, though. So. Again, kind of another point in life where we didn't have a choice. 
mm, and had our backs up against a wall and fought as hard as we could and made it out. But again, you know, maybe I wouldn't have fought that way if I had known what I know today. But that's easy for me to sit here and say. Back then, we were just doing our best. I was waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I was running on crazy adrenaline. You know, we didn't know as people what the hell was going to happen to the world. So easy to say. Um, but, uh, you know, we did our best, and that's all you can ask for as a team. We stuck together, um, and the company made it through. Yeah, that, that that's nice to hear that the company made it through. Uh, but uh, the thing that I didn't really understand, you mentioned that you sold your shares in the company to your partner or what happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So when we got out of the pandemic and um, it was uh, very clear that the business was going to survive and also very clear that it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do going forward. Um, I sold, there was a, it was an, um, an asset acquisition, you know, so between myself and my COO and, um, we're still in business together. Again, I'm the largest investor, one of them in flex that business. He and I own, um, a couple of franchises that are in the sports kid business together. We're actually going to see each other in Vegas, uh, at the end of February. So we're still very close. You know, uh, Michael and I have this relationship that I encourage everybody to find, um, especially in your, in your professional life, if you're running a business, which is basically the yin to your yang. And Michael and I, while, while we enjoy each other's company and um, can totally hang out, you know, business-wise, we have complementary uh, skill sets in the sense that we have very different skill sets and we also he's more conservative than i am uh, at least when it comes to um you know how to run a business whereas i'm like spend 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 he says let's conserve 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 let's try new markets no 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 let's zero in on the market we have um and so uh you know we we have overlapping skill sets in some areas, like maybe operations, although he would probably say I wasn't necessarily a very good operator, but I, I could fake it up to a few million. But he let me do the sales. He told me, anything you sell, I can operate. And he held true to that. And then Michael really looked over the operations and the finances and let me do my thing. So, you know, uh, find that person um, who challenges you and also gives you the opportunity to do what you do best. Yeah, yeah, that's a great advice. And I'm glad that the company uh, moves forward, even though that the acquisition didn't really work at the time. But still, it wasn't a failure, right? It just wasn't, like, there was an opportunity. Yeah, it didn't work, but the company managed to, to go through that, and uh, it continues to operate. You're not there as active as it, as you used to be anymore. But it still kind of worked out at the end, right? It worked out fine. And, you know, it felt like a failure at the time. Mm, but you just have to keep going. I guess maybe the theme of what we're talking about here is that go with the flow. And so we just had to go with the flow. And at a time where, you know, the only thing you could do in our world during the pandemic was to go with the flow. So we did that, um, and it wasn't easy, but that's just the life of the entrepreneur, of the founder, of the, the business owner, that you got to just go with the flow, let the business take you in the right direction, can't really force anything. And that's even true, you know, it's something I really talk about when it comes to, to lead generation and sales. You can't force anybody to buy from you. It will actually have the opposite effect. But if you, if you do the right things to, to nurture leads, to fill your pipeline, and to be confident and clear on your business, 
you won't need to force anybody to buy. Because A, they will want to buy from you. And B, if they don't for some reason, you'll know the reason why. And you'll have the next person, the next person, the next person and confidence to know that you have more leads coming. So it's not just that one deal I got to close. Even if it's a huge deal, you don't have to close it because you'll know that more will be coming. So again, kind of got to go with that flow and know that there are more deals coming. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, uh, totally makes sense. You, I, I like how you look at your relationship with your partner, Michael, in retrospect, uh, found why it did work. Um, I'm wondering, do you have any, say, red flags or things you have to look out for when it comes to business relationships and potential business partners? Yeah, I think you're, I think in the legal world, they say you are leading me, leading me. That's the legal term there. Because you and I have talked about a few different things. And so, yeah, I mean, I have had red flags in my life in terms of certainly business life and people that I brought in where I didn't do enough due diligence um, and, and they didn't either. And unfortunately, we didn't work well together. And so I think, you know, to your point, you have to have complementary skill sets. You do one thing well, I do another thing well. But then you also got to know, and you can't figure this out until you actually, you know, in a really tough situation of how you're going to react. And I had some people who came into the enrichment business who, um, you know, they reacted to situations the only way they knew how. But as the CEO, that did not work well for me. Granted, I was younger. You know, I had less experience in the world. So maybe today I would handle things differently. But at the time, I was who I was. They were who they were. And when the shit hit the fan, we did not work well together. So I don't know how you simulate. Uh, maybe somebody would tell you that, you know, you can do personality tests and things like that. But I don't know necessarily how you simulate when the going gets tough. But I would certainly talk to somebody about how they would handle this situation or that if you're going to be working very closely with them. And the success or the future of your business relies on you guys working together, especially when times are bad. Do you think it's also about gut feeling and just having the subconscious feeling about the person when you're deciding if you want to do business with them or not? A hundred percent. Um the, the guy I was referencing who's on his second business, we always used to say to each other, trust your gut nitwit. You know, because we would get into situations where we didn't trust our gut and then we'd say, Oh my God, did it again. So unfortunately, your gut will tell you but then you also have to listen to it, you know, and sometimes it's hard. Um, trying to think as you're, as you're, as we're talking about this, I don't know if my gut played much of a role, for example, when, when I, we were selecting new business partners, I think, um, you know, I was looking for, for new funding. I was looking for new ideas, new support. And so gut, I didn't check in with my gut. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, definitely trust my gut and, and encourage people to trust their gut in business as well. Yeah, yeah makes total sense. Hey, you mentioned uh, some things about lead generation that people sometimes don't understand. Uh, anything else that uh, with your experience, you could share uh, about some misconceptions or anything like that when it comes to, to lead generation or sales in general. Yeah, totally. I, I had a conversation today with somebody. Um, and, you know, I'm, 
this is open to anybody. I'm in the education space, but I'm happy to talk. I love talking, you know, philosophy when it comes to sales. So I'm happy to walk through anybody's sales process and, and give my thoughts if they're valuable. Um, I was talking to somebody today who's going to join one of our cohorts, I believe, and we were talking about messaging. And he said, oh, I, I started with messaging. I thought that was the most important. I said, well, look, messaging is very important. To me, it's maybe the most important thing. But it's not the first thing that you do. Before you can message, you have to, first of all, maybe have a gut feeling about who your ideal client is. Next, you have to start talking to that person and listening and learning about what their pains are. Not, not what you can offer. Not your latest bell, not your latest whistle, not your mission, not your vision. What do they need? And then from there, you're able to start formulating your approach because you're listening. And you can position yourself on LinkedIn with a sales funnel of a profile and not your resume. And LinkedIn is an important place to be because LinkedIn carries more credibility, especially in the SEO world, than maybe even your own website. And people care about working with you, not your company. I, frankly, Danny, I don't even know who your company is, but I know you. I look you up on LinkedIn, not your company, because people work together. And then after that, you have to start packaging up. We teach something called the signature solution. You have to package up your signature solution the way you transform the lives of your clients in a very clear and concise way. The confused mind does not buy. And so if you kind of walk it backwards, you have listened to people, you have positioned yourself, you have packaged it up. Now you can start targeting, laser targeting people. You don't need 10,000 leads. Maybe you need 100. And then from there, you've got this list of the people you know could be high quality leads for you. And then the messaging comes in. And the messaging is going to be the most important thing because you know who you are. You're clear on that. You're confident. You're very clear and confident on who your ideal client is. And now you need to get into their inbox. You need to get into their LinkedIn. You need to show them who you are by talking to them about their pain points. Not about you. Not about your bells. Not about your whistles. About their pain points and how you can help them. And so that's pretty counterintuitive to the way a lot of people try and sell, air quotes, sell and close. Most people try and sell and close and say, this is what I can do. This is how much it is. Buy it. Let's go. And it takes time and it takes nurturing and it takes learning and listening. And then you can begin to close and you can, you can begin to close quickly once you dial in some of that foundational work, and we do this with companies, and on day one, their confidence and clarity in their business that they've been running for five years, 10 years, 20, 20 years, starts to rise. And, and I love seeing it every single time. Yeah, and the links to Josh's profile website will be in the description. So if you... Uh, if you feel like that you need to uh, boost with this framework of selling from from the start to the end, you're in this space in education. I think that that would be cool uh, if uh, you and Josh could connect and totally. start on that journey. Um, one thing I want to comment on what you said, it's, it's a great framework. Uh, what I've seen myself doing and other people, especially in startups, is failing to do the very first thing is listening to the customer. Mm -hmm. Like it seems like active listening and even empathy towards your customer is something yeah. that people don't really have before they learn that they have to have it. 
uh, which is the, the real reason why the business doesn't work uh, moving forward. So yeah. that, that is something reason. that you have to, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was going to say it's the real reason that my business works. And, it, and, and, you know, I don't know if you play golf or something, but like to teach somebody how to, how to hit a golf ball, not 300 yards, but 30 yards with precision, that's what we're trying to teach people. You know, we're not just trying to teach, we're not just trying to give you leads. We're not just trying to get you to try and close. We're trying to teach this really important information to, so that from 30 yards out, you can be three feet from the hole and put it in. A lot harder to hit a ball 30 yards than 300. And so, you know, that's what we're teaching and it takes time and it takes practice. But once you get it, the mindset, the flow, the feel, you're good to go. It is a, it is an absolute shift. Not easy, but again, once you get it, you get it. Yeah. And I love the analogy with golfing, <laughs> especially as a sports enthusiast that, that yeah. makes complete sense. Hey, cool. before we end, um, anything, any last minute advice or anything that you want to share with people, um, feel free to do that. It could be anything about life, about entrepreneurship, anything. Yeah, I'll stay in the, in the sports industry, sports realm. Um, one of my favorite sayings is go 1-0 and today. When the Washington Nationals won the World Series in 2019. They were 19 and 31 at one time. They were out of it. They were done. And the manager, Davey Martinez, said, you know, just go 1-0 and today. We just got to win one game. We can only win one game. You, know, you can't win 10 games at a time, right? So just got to win one. And that's all they did. They started winning and believing and getting confidence and clarity. And that was a baseball team. So if you think of yourselves as the Washington Nationals in, in 2019, just go 1-0 and every day. And you will start to get that confidence and that clarity. And um, all they did was continue to go 1-0 and until they were the world champs. And they faced adversity all throughout that time. So we are going to face adversity as business owners, as people. But if you just try and go one and know every single day, you're going to be okay. That's a great way to finish the, the podcast. Thanks for, for sharing your story, your insights, your learnings, everything that you shared with us, Josh, today. Uh, it was amazing. Glad to have you on. And maybe Thanks, we'll come back one time in the future and share your new achievements um, and updates because, and maybe new learnings uh, yeah. as well. Well, I'd love to, to continue our conversation. And, and as you said, you know, anybody out there like, you know, who wants to reach out or wants to talk about their lead generation, obviously doesn't have to be in the education space, but that's my kind of my wheelhouse. If I can't help them, I probably have somebody in my network who will, and I will do what people have done before uh, for me, which is connect you to the right person to get you um, the help that you need. So anything I can do to help you or anybody out there, I'm game. Thank you, man. Cool.